<laughs> so it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Alexandra Sim. She's a general academic pediatric fellow at the Children's National Hospital of Dr. Sim graduated from George Mason University with a bachelor's degree in anthropology. And I note in 2018, nine years later, she was recognized by George Mason University as a top 50 exemplar alumnus. She started her medical career at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences through the Community Urban Health Trust. While at GW for medical school, Dr. Sim served as the chapter president of the GW Student National Medical Association, and she worked on the regional board, executive board thereafter. Upon graduation in May 2013, she was recognized by the World Humanism Honor Society as well as by the Department of Pediatrics, which she received their award via trend here. Dr. Sim then went on to complete a pediatric residency at Spirit Children's National in the Community Health Track and served as chief president in 2016-2017. Of note, she was also awarded the Dr. Frederick Green Pediatric Residency Award for advocacy at Spirit Children's National. She will complete her fellowship in general academic pediatrics this June, and also will receive her MPH in epidemiology from GW this year. She has made an impressive achievement on her career path to become a physician investigator, and her interests include health disparities and equity, workforce diversity, and health services research, especially as it focuses on the care of children with sickle cell disease. Today she's going to talk to us about her focus in this area, and her talk is entitled, as you see here, Improving Care for Children with Sickle Cell Condition Through Primary Care List. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sim. Thank you all for joining this morning. Thank you for the warm introduction. Um, so we can go ahead and get right into it. Um, during today's session, I'll describe a little bit of my professional background, some of which you've heard already in career aspirations. We will review some definitions that I know most in this room are familiar with around social determinants of health, health disparities, and health equity. And then I'm hoping to use both civil cell disease and civil cell tree as kind of case studies in health disparities. And so we'll use both of those as um, lenses to consider health disparities. Um, at the end, I'll present some strategies for addressing some of these disparities uh, through my own career development. So I don't have any financial disclosure. I did want to make some kind of personal disclosure. So as you've heard, I um, have a social science background with a degree in anthropology. And really some of that um, kind of to illuminate on that a little bit more. I arrived at George Mason as a biology major because I thought that's what I was supposed to be doing uh, as a pre-med person, and I was bored. I was bored from day one in some of those prerequisite classes. Um, Lucky enough, I had signed up for a medical anthropology class that um, kind of piqued my interest and uh, fulfilled one of the general education requirements. And the instructor that semester was a medical anthropologist and opened my eyes to how social sciences can really inform um, some of our questions like clinicians. So by the spring semester, I had changed my major to anthropology and um, really enjoyed the, the social science foundation. I carried that uh, social science lens with me throughout um, every stage. So as you can see, um, where there was an opportunity to focus on community health, I tried to seize that opportunity. Um, I shared with someone this morning that I, I felt like a fake public health person for a long time, and so I really used this opportunity during fellowships to um, learn about research and epidemiology, um, and I'm excited to um, complete that degree over the next couple of months. My clinical focus has um, been primary care, and um, being here at Children's National was where I even kind of learned that I wanted to be a pediatrician, so this really feels like my um, kind of career home, if you will. Uh, I was drawn to pediatrics because of the opportunity for uh, continuity and to build relationships with patients and families, um, and I think here in D.C. we serve, we're lucky to serve a population that um, is marginalized in a lot of ways. And, so I've um, tried to use my privilege as a physician and as a pediatrician to help um, mitigate some of that marginalization. And so my research focus has broadly been on uh, mitigating health disparities and over the past couple of years have focused that interest with the help of Dr. Chirini and Dr. Campbell and others in the room to think about kids with sickle cell disease and sickle cell disease. 
And so I am um, a very visual person, and so uh, this is just kind of a visual depiction of how the interests have focused over time, um, and kind of where published works have uh, fallen in in that in that timeline. There's the published works if you're interested. And so uh, the manuscript that I currently have under review, um, there's one. I'll go into the first one in detail in a bit. I'm around the level baby syndrome with different carrier states. Um, a full nurse asthma paper, um, and two perspective pieces that are under consideration for publication. And so I think that if I were to kind of overlay my interest in primary care and chronic disease, health disparities, and social justice, I think simple cell would be right there in the center of all of those interests. Um, this academic interest has also been informed by some personal experiences. So during training, I lost a childhood friend to complications of sickle cell disease, which really, I think, if I were to try to categorize or intellectualize that a bit, uh, I think the root cause there is poor transition. Um, and so that has really been um, not just an academic interest, but a personal interest around um, when folks transition from pediatric care to adult care and have this burden of a chronic disease, as well as all the social determinants that we know folks are challenged by, um, how can we make outcomes better than what they currently are. And so I've established a professional mission for myself of improving health care for marginalized kids through clinical care and health services research, and a long-term goal of being an independent physician investigator in health services by developing interventions that are focused on mitigating health care. And so we'll kind of talk about some definitions. I know folks in the room are very comfortable because this is at the core of what we all do day to day, whether it's clinically or from a research standpoint. But I like to make sure we're all on the same page. And I love this definition of social determinants. Whenever I'm working with trainees, I find it really helpful to um, talk about social determinants with pediatrics, right? So you can see born, live, learn, work, play, worship, all those environments that kids might be in that ultimately affect quality of life. And I think pediatrics is interesting to think about social determinants. For example, you know, my dad, when I think about him, he's very predictable. He does the same thing basically every single day. Um, he goes to work at the same time. Even on the weekends, he wakes up at the same time. His weekends look just about the same from week to week. But kids are so interesting because where they live might be different than where they go to school. The household that they spend time in uh, on the weekend might differ than during the week or during the summer might differ. So I think social determinants um, in pediatrics is a um, very natural, natural marriage. Um, health disparities we define as things that adversely affect groups that have been systematically um, facing obstacles of health, whether that's from a racial standpoint, religious, socioeconomic status, and you can see lots of other groups there. My interest specifically with health disparities are uh, racial and ethnic health disparities, but there's uh, plenty of work to go around, so um, just to be clear about uh, all those different categories. And then defining health equity, right? So health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people, which requires valuing everyone equally with focused efforts to avoid inequity, historical and contemporary, and the elimination of health disparities. Um, and so there's our definition of health equity from Healthy People 2020. Um, I found myself, as I was putting this together, realizing that now that we're in 2020, wondering what Healthy People 2030 had to say. Um, and the long and short of it is there's still a lot of work to be done, so we're not there yet. Has anyone seen this graphic before? I'm seeing lots of nods, awesome. So um, I love this graphic and thinking about kind of um, the difference between what, you'll hear people talk about quality, less so now, but the difference between um, where things are, you can see um, on the, the far end there, some folks have a great view of that baseball game, and some folks have no chance of even seeing the game. Um, and then health equity being the goal, so really kind of delivering tailored approaches to make sure that folks have that optimal view. And so I find this helpful as I'm thinking about delivering care to my patients or when I'm thinking about research questions, really thinking about what is that fence made up of and thinking about how can we dismantle that fence or at least get around it, chip a hole in it, pull one of the boards back um, to really kind of give people that, that bird's eye view. And so I'm going to provide two uh, case, case studies and disparities. 
we'll first talk about sickle cell disease and then next talk about sickle cell traits, and then I'll talk about a little bit of the work that I've had the opportunity to do in each space so far. So we'll start with sickle cell disease, which I'm sure most are familiar that is a group of inherited disorders of the red blood cell that's present at birth and can be detected at birth. Um, it's the result of an infected hemoglobin gene at the one point mutation. And complications can be uh, multi organ systems, so it can include basal occlusive crises, acute chest syndrome, stroke, chronic pain, and many other things. The epidemiology there is that one in 365 black children in the United States is born with sickle cell disease, and about one in 16,000 Latino Americans. And so, kind of in this um, game of is it a difference or a disparity, I find it super helpful to think about sickle cell disease in contrast to cystic fibrosis. And I think, you know, within sickle cell disease itself, there are disparities that we can talk about, but for today's purposes, we'll make a comparison to CDF. And so you can see the difference in effects with individuals, and that the average survival is about the same. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we can screening, uh, both state-based and universal screening, the screening for sickle cell disease longer, so you can see the date there. And then new treatments developed, this doesn't affect, this doesn't reflect, rather, some of the newer drugs that are kind of uh, fresh off the presses, if you will. But between 2010 and 2013, there were no new drugs developed for sickle cell disease um, in five for cystic fibrosis. So let's look at why some of that might be. Um, so with sickle cell disease being our comparator, we can see there's more than 11 times more funding for cystic fibrosis uh, per affected individual, and that the foundational funding for CS is 440 times more, and that's not a typo. The NIH funding per affected individual is three times more for CS compared to sickle cell disease, and the NIH Career Development Awards, when you query kind of CF versus sickle cell disease are about the same, but you can see that the publications are two times more in CF. So when we think about, right, the goal is not just to do research for research's sake, but it's to do research so that ultimately impacts patients. Um, I have some questions there, and you might as well. And so when we think about sickle cell disease medical management, we know that it's kind of um, a team-based approach and um, multifactorial, including having a medical home, and care coordination, um, and the cell and prophylaxis. There's some spots up front. Yeah. Um, uh, vaccination schedule, routine screening for complications, and I would argue that those first four bullet points, the primary care pediatrician can be at the have a seat at the table for those things. And then treatments, including both current, well established, as well as uh, emerging treatments. And so some of the work in the sickle cell disease space that I've done to date include a manuscript that's under review around vulnerable baby syndrome, which is kind of this phenomenon of a parent having uh, heightened worry or heightened, um, heightened kind of psych symptoms around anxiety or depression or worry. And it's usually described after a relatively benign event. So a lot of the literature around vulnerable baby syndrome might be, um, for example, a very brief hospitalization for an RSV bronchiolitis um, hospitalization. But parents reporting even after that event has resolved and is not expected to recur, still having heightened worry. Um, and so uh, briefly with that, we found uh, the presence with a validated tool, found the presence of vulnerable baby syndrome in parents that had kids with both sickle cell carrier status and CF carrier status but more so in the sickle cell trait parents, and that it was inversely related to health literacy, and so those with lower health literacy had more vulnerable baby syndrome reported as a tool. Uh, with Dr. Campbell, I did a secondary data analysis around sickle cell diagnostic patterns in Ghana, and that was a great opportunity, one, for me to um, look at some international data and really compare how sickle cell uh, disease is diagnosed um, in a state outside of the United States, and uh, shortly found there uh, that there's much more reliance on diagnosis in the acute setting, so during a pain crisis, during a hospitalization, as opposed to here how we're able to diagnose the vast majority of folks via newborn screening. And with Dr. Campbell um, working on a project around uh, adverse childhood experiences and social determinants of health, 
um, for children with sickle cell disease. So trying to understand first and foremost what the prevalence of things like trauma or food insecurity are with children that have sickle cell disease, and then trying to figure out if that impacts sickle cell outcomes. So this kind of came about because I, in kind of Dr. Campbell's mentorship, we realized our patients deal with a lot of the same things, whether they have sickle cell disease or not, and so trying to understand how some of those social experiences impact outcomes. And so I guess uh, before we go on to the sickle cell trait piece, I hope that um, my work moving forward can uh, be similar to what I've done so far. So really thinking about what are the skill sets and the kind of emerging areas of expertise that I bring to the table as someone with a social science background and an emerging kind of uh, skills and health disparities, how can I lend that to the, the subspecialty space? And so next we'll talk about sickle cell trait again as a kind of example of a space in which there might be some health disparities and some examples of what we could potentially do about it. So it's estimated that uh, a little less than 10% of African Americans have sickle cell trait. Most people with sickle cell trait live asymptomatically, although the um, research in this space is emerging, uh, we are starting to recognize that uh, there can be complications with sickle cell trait, particularly in um, times of uh, extreme physical duress. So for example, professional athletes or those in the military. Those are still considered relatively rare, though. Um, and we know that having sickle cell trait has important reproductive implications um, because of the logical of the inheritance pattern. And so previous studies around sickle cell trait uh, counseling have demonstrated that adults with sickle cell trait have limited knowledge about their own status and that people with sickle cell trait rarely receive genetic counseling and that they identify family as a major source of where they get their information from when they do seek information about sickle cell trait. And that again, when we think about is, there, is this a, just a difference or is it a disparity, when we compare those with sickle cell trait to children that have CF carrier status, sickle cell trait positive children are less likely to receive formal genetic counseling from any provider, whether it's their pediatrician <coughs> or someone with uh, more advanced training in that state, and less likely to receive a referral to a specialty center or to a genetic counselor. Studies with parents have shown that formal sickle cell trait genetic counseling decreases their anxiety, improves their knowledge about having sickle cell trait, and facilitates dialogue between family members um, and also is effective. Um, and that knowledge can be enhanced in our kind of uh, technological age that we're currently in, sickle cell trait personal knowledge can be enhanced by uh, multimedia modules, so really thinking about how to use technology uh, to deliver that information. Previous studies with providers have identified contact, content gaps in what's delivered to families around sickle cell trait status, and a varying degree of detail in what pediatricians tell parents about having sickle cell trait uh, for their children, despite those same pediatricians saying that they've gotten formal training um, on what to say about sickle cell trait. And so what I kind of started to identify just in my very uh, junior clinical practice is that there really seemed to be a lack of guidance via an evidence-based, but also parent-informed best practices around sickle cell trait. And so in clinic, I would kind of find myself first thinking, all right, what am I supposed to say when the newborn screen comes back and says sickle cell trait positive on it and the parents are, you know, back for that two-week visit? But I also started to ask colleagues, well, what do you guys say? I'm thankful that um, at uh, Children's Health Center Anacopia, it's a pretty collaborative environment, so no one ever minds um, kind of asking questions or uh, learning from one another. And I found that all of us were kind of saying different things um, as far as the amount of information we were giving initially when we were repeating that information, um, and kind of, you know, whether or not we were referring families. Um, and so, kind of that selfish question from the clinical setting uh, helped me to develop some, some research questions. And so I uh, got an award from the APA's Rapid Mechanism for their 2019-2020 cycle. Uh, the project is called Communicating with Parents about their child's sickle cell trait. Uh, Dr. Beth Cherini is my local mentor, Dr. Jason Wang is my national mentor, and we have kind of a multidisciplinary team uh, helping me in this effort, including 
Dr. Campbell, including some public charities folks. Um, and so the aims here are to explore the counseling experiences of parents after the receipt of their child's sickle cell trait positive result, and then identify what parents' preferences are with counseling. So I really envision it almost as a who, what, when, where type of project, both um, in kind of past and thinking forward. And so um, I'll go through kind of the interview template. The goal here with uh, this is a qualitative project, and I hope that the findings can really help inform the development of my kind of K application or K equivalent uh, specific aims. And so we're partnering with the Virginia Department of Health, which is really exciting for me. Um, not only am I able to hopefully answer some of my research questions, but it's been really fun also to partner with um, an outside group and figure out what some of their questions are about their processes. And so that's been good learning and kind of good teamwork. We're conducting semi-structured phone interviews with parents who have children between 2 and 12 months old that the state of Virginia has identified as sickle cell trait positive. And then this is kind of an outline of the interview script. And so we start with asking them about their previous experiences before this current infant was born um, around sickle cell traits, sickle cell disease, as well as newborn screening broadly. Then we ask them if they know their own sickle cell trait status um, and the status of the child's other parents. And then really the kind of bolded parts are the crux of the interview, so trying to understand what those experiences were around disclosure of the sickle cell trait status, um, if any. So some parents that we've interviewed said, um, I don't really remember getting any counseling, so we're trying to flesh that out. Um, and then what their uh, counseling preferences would be. So if they could, and we really try to describe in the interview, if you could kind of wave your magic wand or you could kind of be instrumental in informing best practices, what would that look like? And then we try to get a sense of what their information seeking about sickle cell trait has been since the disclosure of the child's sickle cell trait result. Um, the details here aren't super important. This slide is meant to just show that um, we're collaborating with the Department of Health and they're helping to use their database to identify eligible children um, and helping with the recruitment and that the interviews are taking place on the phone one-on-one. -on -one. Both parents are invited to participate as well. And so our progress to date um, are establishing this partnership with Virginia Department of Health, uh, IRB approval from both Children's National and from Virginia Department of Health IRB. Um, we started study recruitment. We sent out uh, two out of our three waves of uh, recruitment mailing, um, and we've started our interviews, and so that's been really fun. Um, we have not yet um, completed the analysis. We're uh, not quite done yet, but I wanted to give you some demonstrative quotes of uh, what we've gotten from the interviews so far, which I think are, are really telling uh, in and of themselves. And so kind of one category that things have fallen into our previous knowledge, and so I'll just read through some of these quotes and let you sit with them. My three-year-old has a trait also. My husband has sickle cell disease, and it has been rough. My stepsister found out that she had the trait, but she didn't know until she had a baby. We knew that both parents had to have the trait in order for the child to have the disease. My husband, with sickle cell disease, wanted children, but we were really scared. In the realm of notification, uh, we found out at the two-week-old checkup from the same doctor as my older child. I don't remember getting anything from the health department, and I feel like that is something that I would have remembered. And I guess I figured if it was something to worry about, I would have gotten more information then this is just what he has. And then as far as recommendations, I'm glad that the physician told us and gave us all the information that we asked for. We got the information on time and did not have to keep bothering the doctor for it. I suppose if it was something that we should actually worry about, then maybe someone could call or include a pamphlet. It just comes off like it's something that we don't have to think about or have to remember later in life for him. So we're kind of at the stage with the data collection that we've done a handful of interviews and I'm working on developing the code book um, that will then kind of be uh, used to code the remainder of the data. And so our take home point. So hopefully I've made it clear that health disparities exist both in sickle cell disease and in sickle cell trait, particularly as it pertains to counseling. 
um, and that those have negative impacts on patient outcomes. And that there really are opportunities in this space, and I think specifically opportunities for primary care pediatricians and, and specialists to collaborate and figure out what are the ways that we can close the gap, um, essentially, both identifying and dismantling the parts of that fence that I showed you in that graphic. Um, and, you know, my ideas about what some of that intervention could look like, I think there's a lot of similarity both in the sickle cell and sickle cell trait spaces around improving both patient and family education, enhancing provider knowledge, and leveraging technology, um, particularly in the sickle cell trait counseling space, I think really working to get parents' help to work on establishing best practices so that on the front lines we're doing um, our due diligence. Um, as far as some early junior faculty career goals, um, my focus kind of in uh, the early part of that will be completion and publication of primary data collection projects. And I feel that I kind of academically live in this space where general pediatrics, sickle cell, and health disparities overlap. Establishing a robust and multidisciplinary mentorship team to include epidemiologists, health services researchers, hematologists and those in primary care, and then really continuing to establish interdepartmental and cross-discipline uh, uh, collaboration. I think that's a space that I really excel in, particularly because of coming from a, a social science background to start with. And then uh, the goal will be early uh, development of specific aims and submission uh, of a K, particularly the K-23 mechanism um, or K-equivalent, uh, potentially through the Harold Amos mechanism early on in the junior faculty role. That is everything that I have. I think we did okay on time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Is it comparable or is it 
I would imagine it's comparable. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we did a study about four or five years ago, and the inpatient costs, I mean, it's well over a billion for sickle cell. Um, for inpatient costs for sickle cell disease in pediatrics, it's $900 million per year by itself. Um, also, there was another study that we looked at the inpatient costs of CF, the CF, asthma, uh, spina bifida, and um, sickle cell disease. And we noticed that the inpatient cost was also higher in the sickle cell patients compared to the cystic fibrosis patients. Some of that had to do with the fact that uh, less patients in the sickle cell space were transitioning um, to adult care. So a lot of the burden of disease in the, in the sickle cell case where it was actually in the um, young, the adolescent and young adult patients. So commonly in sickle cell disease, <clears throat> a lot of the pediatric hospitals will care for adult patients from 18 even to 25 in some cases. And, and most of the cases are drivers of admissions and also just healthcare costs with chronic disease and, and the transition phase. So there's been some public. So it's, it's higher, I know, for inpatient costs, but I'm not sure about the total cost outpatient costs. There's also uh, an excellent article published in Blood about research differences between CF and sickle cell disease. That's about eight years old, and there hasn't been another one. Since. <clears throat> I had uh, two comments. One was about the um, relationship between sickle cell disease and cystic fibrosis in terms of the foundation support for it. And, uh, you probably know the history that what would happen with cystic fibrosis was that the foundation, cystic fibrosis foundation, actually helped fund research um, that led to the uh, development of a, a new drug, which uh, was then sold to a major company, and the cystic fibrosis foundation got $2 billion uh, at their share of that sale, um, which accounts for what they were able to do. But if you go back further, the question is, well, why didn't the Sickle Cell Disease Foundation also have money to invest in that? And that, again, goes to, you know, who's affected right. and uh, right. who, uh, who, therefore, is going to invest in, in doing this and so to speak, stable disparities in a different fashion. My second comment was um, about health disparities and the uh, and your uh, if you could comment on the importance of teaching uh, professionalism in terms of uh, trainees so that as they go on in the future some of these issues you brought up uh, might be Yeah, I mean I think that um, you know when we think about disparity we have to think about if there's patient level factors or uh, neighborhood community level factors, but also what we as providers are bringing to the table. I mean, I think, you know, for better or worse, bias is a part of what we're thinking about in academia a lot more now than ever before. And I think that um, it's paramount and imperative to ensure that we're, and I think we're really lucky here at Children's National because it's a part of the longitudinal curriculum for our trainees um, to think about bias and how it's, uh, you know, rearing its head in the outpatient space and the inpatient space. Um, so I think, unfortunately, we're not at the point that we have a magic bullet for bias, but I think awareness is where we have to start. Um, and I think there's there's no doubt that uh, that's playing a part of what's happening here. To you back, um, Dr. Vetro's comments, the disparity then become, has become uh, institutionalized, for lack of a better word, because in newborn screening, part of what fueled um, Alex's project is in newborn screening, uh, the CF Foundation requires that any CF sites have uh, carrier uh, counseling for their positives from that state. And if they do not comply to 100%, they are at risk of losing their CF. So in the state of Michigan, I watched the rise from 70% was talk of how difficult it was to get the patients to cross the bridge from one building to the other to when this went into effect from the CF Foundation, from patients 
the 29% of patients that were missing to cross the bridge and get the counseling that they had requested, mm -hmm. they were required to get. No such requirement or threat of funding loss, unfortunately, exists for sickle cell, nor does such a requirement exist at the state uh, newborn screening level. So that further sort of pushes the disparity because the CF Foundation, as you rightly pointed out, has such um, such leverage in its funding as well as its, its um, sort of power, for lack of a better word, for good, but also just yeah. it, it, it increases this disparity. That's a lovely talk, a wonderful combination of your plans for your career development in, in the content area. I'm really interested about the trait story. Mm -hmm. um, so as nephrologists, I can tell you, we see patients who manifest um, abnormality. Yep. I mean, it's not just silent carriers. Right. And, and what I wonder is, um, the, is this is sort of a peri of pushing for education. I mean, this is such a common disease. In, in the black community. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a very high burden of carrier status. Mm -hmm. And really understanding what is the burden of morbidity in that state um, and how do we push uh, information out to practicing pediatricians right. to, to be able to look for those kinds of things and what the long-term consequences are in terms of chronic disease, in terms of, of cardiac function, certainly in terms of renal function. It's not 100% of carriers, but there is a subset. And so, and then that would marry very nicely then with the need to tell people right. that your child is carrying one copy of this gene. Right. And so, can you talk a little bit more about the morbidity and what's been done to study the morbidity in the context of traits? Yeah, I think there's, as you said, I think we're learning a lot. I think we've learned a lot. I think there, um, you know, probably used to be, and maybe people still do, it used to be a day in which people said, Oh, you have this carry state, it means nothing, don't worry about it. I think we I think we know more than that. I do still think we have a lot more to learn around what organs it affects and under what conditions um, and how frequently. Um, so I think the jury may still be out when there's like true uh, morbidity around civil cell trait right. complication. Um, I think we have to let, in some ways, let parents guide us for what they want to know. You know, I think this study, um, is looking at parents of infants and what information they want. But then, you know, the second piece of that may be parents of teenagers and teenagers themselves and what they want to know, um, particularly as the reproductive uh, implications. So just a follow-up genetic question. So in, in, the, in the city of Washington, we have a very high burden of the able well one variants that are associated with chronic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. and, and at least I don't know this and I haven't looked very hard, but are, because these are two common situations, have people looked to see if there is an increased burden of kidney disease when you're carrying sickle cell trait and one of one or two of the variants in, in the April well one gene? Without that, yeah, because that would be really important for people to know about. Yeah, without the um, the variant that you mentioned, the uh, risk is increased through the like yeah. So yeah. Um, the so part of the history Africa group was just funded. From the uh, Commonwealth, fund, the Common Fund, and also the Wellcome Trust, they have the H3 Africa kidney mm -hmm. study. I don't know if you know about yeah. that mm -hmm. with Ojo and mm -hmm. So when I was in Michigan, what they were looking at um, 3,000 cases, um, and that was their that was the aim. The aim was to look at the impact of sickle cell trait on the development of actual kidney disease and the progression of kidney disease. Um, and what the preliminary study showed, it's very preliminary because the study has not been published yet, um, that the carrier rate of the APOL1 gene in Sub-Saharan Africa, this is Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, um, is almost coexisting. So the APOL1 gene, there is some link to the inheritance of both that they found, um, but they have not published the, the the uh, results. So right now, to my knowledge, there is no data to suggest that's the case. Number two, um, here in here in DC, um, I can say that the the there is a diversity of patients, not uh, not only African Americans, but also first generation patients from the Caribbean, also from Sub-Saharan Africa, and I would say in our population. Here at Children's National, we probably have at least 30, 40 percent of our patients are from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so 
when you think about that, um, that also takes, that's a snapshot picture of Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's why I think April 1 gene in D.C. is so high, because mm -hmm. we have a high percentage of Sub-Saharan African patients. Mm -hmm. and, and just just a diverse population here in D.C. I can tell you from Michigan, it's completely different here. Our population there was like maybe 10 to 15 percent. Here is at least 40 yeah. percent. Thank you. I'll hang around if you have other questions, but I know everybody has stuff to do. Thank you guys Thank for you. coming.